Thank you so much for uh, your word, how powerful it is, how searching um, to our hearts and our motives and our desires. Uh, and as we come this morning looking at the city, the ways it plays uh, not only on our desires to glorify God and serve the common good, but also uh, on our desires to make a name for ourselves, to build up our um, ego, our reputation. Uh, I pray this morning that um, even our hearts would be searched and examined as we consider our motives and consider the things that drive us and motivate us and, and move us, uh, Father. And as we gather as your people in your name this morning, would we um, have a fresh sense of our calling uh, in this place uh, to make Jesus famous, to, to make the gospel uh, go forth in this city uh, and sound forth in this city in a way that lives would be transformed and communities formed and the city renewed and uh, the world impacted through church planning. We pray that uh, this morning, we pray that you'd come by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, you'd speak to us. We know you don't need any amplification uh, to bring uh, your word into our hearts by your Spirit. And so would you come, would you do that this morning um, for the glory of your great name? And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to try and project, I'm going to try and speak up and do what I do best, which is talk really loud here. This is my moment here, so I can, I can talk loud and, uh, and no one's going to yell at me here. Hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, it's good to have uh, everyone here. Good to be in the midst of our new series for the city, God's Heart for the City in the Story of Scripture. Um, it's been really exciting to delve in, do lots of reading um, in the Scriptures and then lots of reading on on city ministry, urban ministry, what it looks like for us to be the church here in the mix. And so, uh, very excited if you're here. Um, if you were uh, not here last week, I kicked things off um, in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and true, and I, and I tried to show that God's design for the garden in the beginning was actually uh, a design for a garden city. And so if you missed that thesis, I took a, a good while to kind of build that out across the theme of Scripture, how God's design in the garden was a design for a garden city. God wanted humanity to take all the wealth and riches in the garden, all of the raw potential, all of the raw resources, and make them into something beautiful, something we call culture for the glory of God and the good of the world. And that takes people gathering together to create those wonderful uh, inventions of culture that we enjoy so much. I mentioned things like the iPhone 7 and other wonderful cultural creations that serve our lives uh, so well and allow us to do what we do. And so uh, that happens in cities when people gather together in clusters and agglomerations and they come up with new and creative innovative ideas where entrepreneurs are working together and doing uh, their best to come up with the newest inventions the newest ideas uh, medical people are clustering together to do research and cure cancer and uh, do these wonderful things that we see happening in cities we see businesses started and uh, you know finance and capital raised and wonderful things happening uh, in and around uh, the city. Cities are cultural centers. Cities are places of innovation, and so cities uh, are places where uh, so much good can happen for um, the world, and that's why cities attract the best and the brightest, and so that's why you find that those people go to cities. They want to be where the action is at. They want to be the, where the best, most talented, most advanced in their field um, want to go, and so cities have tremendous potential for unleashing good, for glorifying God, um, they can be wonderful places, but that's not the whole story, of course, as anyone who's lived in a city knows, right? Cities also um, can unleash tremendous evil, can unleash tremendous bad for the world around it. Cities are not neutral, I said last week. They can unleash tremendous good in the world. Um, all these people gathered together, people created in the image of God with ingenuity, with ideas, with creativity, with imagination, can do incredible things for the good of the world and the glory of God. But they can also take those same gifts, that same gift of being made in the image of God, that same creativity, that same innovation, and use it, of course, for destructive purposes. And so in our text uh, for this morning, we're going to see one of those purposes, and that is not to make uh, a city that would be for the glory of God and for the good of the world, but at, rather to make a city that would be a city that would make a name for, 
for themselves, a city that would make a name for their own ego and their own pride. And so cities, of course, driven by ego, driven by that urge to succeed, uh, driven by that urge to fame, success, um, can also be places of uh, great evil. As we know, and we've seen that unleashed, um, cities can be places that are very cutthroat, very competitive, very dog-eat-dog. Cities can be places filled with workaholics that are kind of stepping on each other as they're climbing the ladder to try to make it to the top. The competition of the city, which can bring out the best in all of us, can also bring out the worst in all of us as well, right? We know uh, that that competition, right, can bring us to our best, can take us uh, to the best we've ever, and push us beyond where we've ever gone before, but it can also push us into very dark places. It can push us into places of where we're, we're out to advance ourselves at the expense uh, of others, where we're out to, to advance our cause and our agenda at the expense of other people, groups, and other minorities, and things um, like that. Cities uh, can uh, be places uh, that are not healthy, not good places to grow. And so if last week I looked at the tremendous potential of the city, this week I want to look at some of the perils of the city, and particularly the peril uh, that we see here in the city and that's given for us in our text this morning of trying to make a name for ourselves and the dangers that come along uh, with that. And so, uh, so the aim for this morning, if I already break that down a little bit more specifically, is that we would be a church not trying to make a name for ourselves, uh, but a church trying to make Jesus famous in our city. And so not a church out there to develop our name. Aren't we a great church? You know, don't we have the best stuff in town? Uh, but actually to make a name for Jesus, to make Jesus famous. And so if you're following along, if you're taking notes, uh, I'm going to break this down into three uh, points here. Man's ambition to build a city, God's judgment on their city, and finally a new ambition for the city. So uh, man's ambition to build a city, God's judgment on their city, and a new ambition for our city. So let's look here at man's ambition to build a city. We have it uh, it's been read for us already in Genesis 11, uh, 1 through 4. I'll just go over it again uh, to give you the overview. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And so what we have going on here is that humanity at this point shares a common language, right? They're all, you know, together in the kind of fertile crescent there where, where human civilization began. They're all sharing a common language. They're beginning to multiply rapidly after the flood, as we could see from some of the genealogies. Um, humanity is spreading out over the world, and they're looking for a place to settle, and so they find this vast plain in Shinar, and they think this is the spot where we can build a massive city and a massive tower with its top reaching uh, all the way to heaven. And uh, as we saw last week in Genesis chapter 4, cities are places of cultural innovation, and so um, in Genesis chapter 4, we saw that cities were places where music was invented, where metallurgy was invented, where new agricultural methods were invented. And here uh, we see a similar theme. These ancient city dwellers invented a new, some new architectural, new structural engineering methods, new building methods. They found a way to bake bricks in such a way, to put them in a kiln, heat them to a certain temperature so that these bricks were now harder than stone or as hard as stone so they could build this massive tower up to the heavens. So with these new um, technological advancements, they're able to build an even more advanced city, a larger city, uh, to make a name for um, themselves. And so let me look at really two problems with this great city building project and tower building project, okay? As they're building here, we're going to see that, that somehow um, this whole city building project goes out of alignment with God's calling for his people. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 1, um, God called humanity to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it. And so there's this call 
to make culture, build cities, and then spread this culture out throughout the world. Take the raw stuff of the earth and turn it into great things. Um, but what we see here, rather than fulfilling God's commandment to go and go out there, develop the world for the glory of God, they don't want to be dispersed. And so they say, let's build a great city here. We could all gather together here and not be dispersed over the world as God's commanded us to go bring um, his rule to every corner of the earth so that we could just stay here in this one great city and we could protect ourselves, right? The world after the fall was not the beautiful world of the garden. Um, all of a sudden, outside, right in the wilderness in which they're placed, right, it's a scary place. There's sickness, there's death, there's disease, there's natural da- disasters, there now, there's now violence, there are now you know, the roads are no longer safe because there are bandits and there are wild animals and the world is not a safe place. And so humanity, rather than going out there and establishing God's rule, uh, which would be much more difficult in a fallen, broken world, they just want to huddle up and they want to build a city, build great walls and protect themselves and establish their own security there for themselves. Uh, the second problem we see here in our text is that rather working for the good of humanity and the glory of God, they're working to build a tower that reaches all the way into heavens, into the heavens to make a name for themselves. So this is not, you've got to see, simply the desire to build, you know, a beautiful tower to complement the urban skyline. You know, this is not just like an architectural thing, like wouldn't it be really pretty if we had like a tower somewhere in there and, you know, then we could kind of stamp our our, our skyline on our logo and kind of promote Babel to the rest of the world as a great travel destination. No, this is, this is immense religious ramifications to it. Um, this tower here, if you'll notice there uh, in verse 4, I believe, is going to be a tower with its top in the heavens. And so what they want to do is build a tower that would bring them up to the era where the gods dwell. They think together with our potential, with our ingenuity, with our creativity, we could build our way up into the heavens through this great tower. We could join the pantheon of gods uh, together. Um, We could pierce the divine realm, as one commentator uh, put it. And we know from archaeology that towers like this were built all over the ancient Near East. They're called ziggurats, actually. And so a ziggurat was one of these vast, immense Um, brick stair-like structure that would go upward and upward and upward. And so it was literally a stairway to heaven, okay? You've got this vast, you know, architectural brick structure going higher and higher and higher and higher. And the goal was to put the top in the clouds and so that the people could go up and meet with the gods. And then the gods could come down and meet with them in their civilization and come down into their city. So this this was an ambitious building project designed to build their name up in the clouds, up with the gods themselves, to follow Satan's uh, little dis, you know, deceptive call in the garden to be like gods. They could themselves do that. And so they're working to build this tower up into uh, the heaven, literally a stairway um, to heaven. And so this is the way they're trying to make a name for themselves. If we could build this vast tower, if we could reach the heavens, we'll be great, we'll be important, we'll be significant, we'll be famous, and the whole world will want to kind of rally to our city, join our cause, be a part of what we're doing uh, as humanity has evolved to this next phase uh, to be very much like the gods. And we may be tempted to dismiss all of this as very strange uh, kind of primitive culture here. Like, I mean, do they really think they're going to be able to, like, keep, you know, building their way up to heaven? Like, heaven isn't a, like, you know, really high. It's, <laughs> you know, actually you get into the atmosphere and then you're just going to float away. And so, you know, it's kind of a primitive idea that they could just build and build and build and somehow arrive in heaven, which is kind of in another dimension anyways. Um, but what I want to suggest to you is that really their ancient primitive culture is really not that different from our own today. We may not have ziggurats dotting the skylines of the great cities of the United States, but we certainly do have vast cities with vast skyscrapers, right, that are reaching to the heavens. And, and on these skyscrapers, we, we put a name, don't we? Our own skyline is surrounded with names like DeVos and Van Andel and Meyer and Weggy and, and, and all of these people that are trying to make a name for themselves. If you look at the skylines of our city, you'll see that the tallest buildings are the most important 
buildings in a city. In New York City, right, it's the financial sector. All the skyscrapers reaching up. The god of that city is finance. If you go to Washington, D.C., right, they don't let you build the skyscrapers as high, you know, because all the government buildings tower up there. The Capitol building, you know, the White House, all the monuments are because really the power there is in the political sector. And, and as you look around the cities of our world, you'll see, again, monuments to man's desire to build a name for ourselves. We haven't been able to get away from that. There's still this insatiable human hunger to make a name for ourselves. And that's why so many people move to cities, isn't it? Right? We want to, we are driven, we're restless, we're ambitious, and we want to head out to a city where we can make a name for ourselves instead of a as the Disney classics have it, you know, the hero heading off to a far country to go make his fortune. Today, you know, the young people of our culture, where do they do? They go on a quest, on a journey to the big city, right? To go make it, to get discovered, to make it big, to be famous, to make their fortune. And then maybe they'll move back to the suburbs after they have, you know, conquered the great city, found their, you know, spouse, and then maybe they can move out and build a big McMansion out in the suburbs somewhere. But, but that's how it works, right? If you want to build a name for yourself, right, in our day and age, people move to the cities because that's where the best, the most talented, it's where the money's at. That's where the movers and shakers are at. That's where the powers that be are. That's where government, that's where business, that's where arts and culture, media, all those places are centered in the city. So people move to the city to make a name for ourselves. And you say, well, what's so wrong with that? I mean, you know, that's, that's great. We're all here. We're in the city. We're young. We're doing college. We've got jobs in the city. We're making a name for ourselves. What's, what's so bad about that? What's so wrong about wanting, not wanting to be dispersed uh, around the world here? Let's look, let's look secondly here at God's response to uh, these city builders here in verses 5 through 9. They've got this ambition. They've built their, their great city or their building, their great city, their great tower, um, reaching to heaven. And, and what's God's response to this? How, do, how does God respond to this vast tower building project, this attempt to make a name for themselves? In verse 5, God says this, or we, the narrator actually tells us, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And so you have to really appreciate a little bit of the irony here that the narrator is trying to point out. There's some real humor in the text, and if you appreciate the Hebrew, you really get to enjoy the humor here. You know, the, the narrator is kind of like, here's God. He's like, hey, where, where is that tower down there? I heard they were building a tower up to heaven, but I, I can't see it from up here in heaven. So where is it? I guess I'm going to have to come down and see if I can actually find it. Maybe if I keep going down far enough, I'll go down to their city. Then I'll be able to see the tower that they're building to heaven. There, there's a little bit of irony here. The narrator is trying to poke fun at the pretensions of this, these city builders. They think, oh yeah, we're going to build our tower up to heaven. We're going we're gonna to usurp God's rule. We're going to usurp God's glory. We're going we're gonna to enter the divine realm ourselves. We ourselves are going to become immortals. And uh, God's kind of like, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't even see what you're doing down there. I, you, you may have some grand ambitions. You may think, you know, you're something special. You may think you've accomplished great things and incredible things. But, you know, from where I'm standing, I can't even see what you're doing. So, so again, saying, look, I, I got to come down there and see what exactly these people are doing. You know, despite all of our you know, formidable God-given abilities, our innovation, our productivity, our creativity, you know, humanity can never earn its way up to God. We can never build our way up to God. We can never work our way up to God by the kind of strength of our ingenuity and our power. And that doesn't, of course, keep us from trying, you know, as human beings, but, uh, but God doesn't really have any time for that. And if you look um, at, you know, testimonies to this, uh, you'll see throughout the uh, history of humanity some remarkable testimonies, those that have tried, right, to earn their way up to heaven, tried to make a name for themselves, and how disillusioning that can be. Perhaps the most classic illustration in the Bible is King Solomon, right? The wealthiest man that ever lived. The man who had, you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know, the man who ruled a vast empire um, in the ancient Near East when Assyria and Babylon were at a low point. The man who had power, the man who had wealth, the man who had sex, the man who had everything he wanted. 
uh, wrote in his memoirs at the end of his life in, a, in Ecclesiastes uh, 1, uh, 14, he said, I've seen everything that's done under the sun, all of man's ambitions, and behold, it is all vanity, a striving after the wind, a man who sought fame, sought to make a name for himself, sought to make Israel the greatest kingdom on earth at the end of his life could look back on it and say uh, it was all a chasing after um, the wind. A, a more contemporary um, illustration might be Madonna, the great uh, pop singer. Uh, in an interview with Vanity Fair, she said this about her efforts to make a name for herself, to be someone. I thought this was so well said. She said, all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I'm always struggling with fear. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. And I find a way to get myself out of that again and again. My drive is, in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And it's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. So one of the most incredibly successful pop musicians right, of all time, if you say anybody's made a name for themselves in the industry, right, still struggling, still wondering, is it enough? Right? Have I succeeded? Am I really special? Am I really that significant? Uh, our delusions of grandeur and, important, and, and importance are often that. They're just delusions. Right? They're, they're vanity, and sometimes even the celebrities see through it. They arrive at the top and then they do the famous celebrity self-destruct mode, right? Where all of a sudden they're getting checked into rehab because they're on drugs or alcohol or they're anorexic or whatever the issue is. You know, so much in our culture, I mean, we've seen this trend over and over again. Celebrities trying to make a name for themselves. I mean, we just expect it now. When are they going to crash and burn and their life is going to fall apart and, you know, they're going to write an album about it and sell a few more zillion CDs or whatever that sort of thing might be. And, and we see this drive, right, to succeed in our culture over and over again. We push people. We push our athletes to the very brink, you know, of success. I remember uh, Calvin Johnson in an interview recently. He's like, I can't even, like, walk down my own stairs anymore because, you know, this push, this drive to be the best wide receiver in the NFL and retired, you know, last year because, you know, the drive, the push to succeed had left him, you know, <laughs> hardly able to play with his kids. And you, you look at the celebrity culture and the way it pushes people to make a name for themselves and some of the, the toxic kind of consequences that go alongside of that. And, and so, so God is just trying to call that out as these ancient cities builders, they have this urge to build a name for themselves. God's saying, look, you, you may think you're pretty special. You may think you're a celebrity. You're great. But in reality, right, that fame that you're seeking, that success that you're seeking, it's ultimately elusive. It's going to slip through your grasp. And so after offering these city builders a little bit of perspective on their great city, um, he goes on to show uh, how God comes down to put a stop to this building project because it's a danger to civilization, right? This is not just simply a matter of, well, you can go pursue your ambition. You know, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to, you know, this is serious business, and God is going to put a stop to this building project because of the danger that it poses uh, to humanity. And so in verse 6, we say, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. And, and so it's interesting, right, that, you know, the narrative says, nothing they propose will now be impossible. And we go, whoa. You know, is God, like, nervous there in heaven? Like, hey, these guys are going to build a tower to heaven. Of course not, right? He's sitting up in heaven going, I can't even see your tower down there. Obviously, he's not concerned that they're going to, like, arrive into the realm of the divine here. What God is concerned about is the potential for evil as they've gathered together as a city. You just have to go back a few chapters in Genesis right before the flood to see that every inclination of man's heart was only evil all the time. And now you have humanity again gathering to build a name for themselves in a city, and God's saying the potential for evil in the midst of the city is great. It's tremendous. 
the kind of racism, the kind of classism, the kind of nationalism, the kind of uh, pick your ism here, racism that's going to happen as these people gathering this city make a name for themselves at the expense of all the other peoples in the earth is going to be catastrophic. And so God steps in, God intervenes, God breaks up their languages so they can no longer communicate, coordinate their operations, and God disperses them to the corners of the earth as God had originally designed for them to do. And so we see here, uh, it's, not Im- it's implicit in the text, that this desire right, to make a name for ourselves, it's the, res- it's the root of our classism that we see in our culture. It's the root of our tribalism, racism, nationalism. It's the root of this, we're really important, and because we're really important, we're going to exalt ourselves, and we're going to put other people down. We are going to advance our cause, and we're going to do it at the expense of others. We see this, of course, on a very personal level, right, in our own lives, where, you know, you go to the big city and you've got to advance, and so you've got to make it up the corporate ladder, so you've got to do whatever you've got to do to make it succeed, and often at the expense of others, right? You're going to have to step on other people to get to the top. You're going to have to, you know, perhaps work long hours, abandon your family, your friends, maybe even your faith to succeed, to arrive at that pinnacle of success, to find the fame that you've been looking for, to make the fortune that you've been longing for, uh, to be able to uh, collect the power that you've been looking for. The, the repercussions, right, of this drive, this ego, are so dangerous, right? On a personal level, the ways we will run over our own families to succeed in our jobs, to succeed in our careers, um, to do Uh, things like that. It's dangerous then at a group level when one group of us goes, well, those people are really not that important, you know. You know, our, you know, nice white middle class culture, we're important in that other, those other races, they're not really that important. And all of a sudden you have racism, both systematic and also um, just uh, in the, in the air that we breathe. You know, you have uh, a culture that doesn't care for uh, other people. So at the highest level you see the nationalism. Look back at World War II, the Nazis and their super race, they were going to go and, you know, promote this race to the world and the danger of that cause. We've seen that in Soviet Russia and so many other places, right, where, where a nationalism takes place. All of a sudden, one group of people are out to get other people. All of this is coming out of this Tower of Babel, this desire to make a name for ourselves. It's a very toxic, it's a very dangerous thing um, to see, right? The powers, the pressure of the city can work on us in all the wrong ways, the wonderful things that the city can provide, which I talked about last week, the creativity, the ingenuity, the innovation, the wonderful new inventions, self-driving cars, new iPhones, I mean, new vaccines, new medications, new treatments, you know, the cure for cancer, wonderful examples of things cities do wonderfully, but cities can also create, you know, the atom bomb. They can also create new infrastructure for the military complex. They can also create, you know, so many uh, evil things as well. So many inventions that can be destructive for humanity. Cities can bring out the best in us and can bring out uh, the worst in us. I had, I just handpicked one illustration of this, which I thought was so poignant and so scary to those of us like myself that are maybe a little bit more driven in the workaholic direction, uh, very driven to make a name for themselves, very driven to be successful uh, and to succeed. And I thought this was just, this was just so crazy. Uh, um, Tim Keller in his really wonderful little book, Counterfeit Gods, uh, uh, says that after the economic crisis, uh, which began in mid-2008, there followed a string of uh, suicides of formerly wealthy and well-connected individuals. Uh, the acting chief uh, financial officer of Freddie Mac, the federal home loan mortgage company, hanged himself in his basement. Uh, the chief executive of Sheldon Good, a leading U.S. real estate firm, shot himself in the head behind the wheel of his red Jaguar. A French money manager invested the wealth of many of Europe's royal and leading families and who lost $1.4 billion of his clients' money in Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, slit his wrist and died in his Madison Avenue apartment. A Danish senior executive with the HSB Bank hanged himself in the wardrobe of his 500-pound uh, a night suite in Knightsbridge, London. And when a Bear Stearns executive learned that he would not be hired by J.P. Morgan Chase, which had bought his collapsed firm, he took a drug overdose and leapt from the 29th floor of his office building. Can you imagine 
the pressure, right, to succeed, the pressure to make a name for yourself, the pressure to have arrived at the pinnacle of your profession, to make money beyond anything we could here in Michigan probably could even imagine, right, these guys, and yet the pressure of that, you know, built on these guys so intensely that when it all fall apart, they couldn't even go on living, much less face the world around them, and died in very tragic shocking ways and you say well that's not me i'm not like anywhere near that like i'm not going to go jump off you know the top floor of the amway and kill myself and you know make it on m live um but what are the ways in your life maybe that this desire to make a name for yourself this desire to like build your little kingdom wherever it might be this desire to build your success whether it's in ministry whether it's in business whether it's in your school academics whether it's in your uh, whatever field, nonprofit you're in, um, what are the dangers there? Areas where you see in your own life your desire to make a name for yourself, to be successful, to be famous, to arrive, and what are the dangers inherent in your own life that you see? Dangers as you look at your own relationships, right? The friendships maybe that you're neglecting, the family that maybe you're neglecting, not spending uh, adequate time on. Uh, the opportunities to serve in the city, your neighbors and your, your friends, this, this desire to build our name for ourselves while it's celebrated in our culture, the consequences are, are toxic. I mean, they are so toxic, and they destroy so many people's lives, so many relationships, and so much of the fabric of our culture is being uh, ripped apart by this drive to make a name for ourselves, to be famous, to be the next American Idol or whatever other dated show you can, you can dig up there for it. And so how can we avoid this futility of working our way to heaven, this vanity of making uh, a name for uh, ourselves? We need to see here, and this is so significant, we need to see that while we can never work our way up to heaven, our best attempts to build a name for ourselves, our best attempts to work our way up to that next uh, ring in the ladder, we're, we're never going to make it to where we want to be. We're never going to arrive in the sphere of the divine where we finally arrive, where we're finally accepted, where we're finally at the top of our rung. We can never work our way up to heaven. We can never build our way up to heaven. But God comes down to seek and save that which is lost. The, the hope in our text this morning is, is that God comes down, and he comes down first in our text this morning in judgment, recognizing the incredible evil that the city uh, could promote throughout the world. God comes down, and in a gracious judgment, divides up these people from this ego project that they've created, and he splits up their languages, and he disperses them over the course of the earth. God comes down in a very gracious kind of judgment, um, so that the world we live in would not be destroyed by further evil. But we have to look forward a few thousand years to the future uh, if we're going to catch this story in its full context to look at another time when God himself would come down, this time not in judgment, but this time in a rescue project to seek and save that which is lost. You see, the, the counter to Babel, this desire to build our way up into heaven, really finds itself in God coming down in the person of Jesus. And God comes way down. He comes all the way down into just a little tiny baby in uh, kind of a backwater town outside of Jerusalem and, and is born into our world, into the brokenness, into the messiness, into the futility, into the frustration, a world surrounded by uh, all kinds of politicians plotting their way to get to Rome, to the center of power in that day, all the zealots that are running around trying to free Israel, uh, a world full of the same kind of sub political intrigue, the same kinds of greed, the same kinds of power struggles, the same kind of uh, looking for meaning and you know, fame, and all of the things that we look for, Jesus stepped down into that kind of a world, and instead of building a name for himself, he was the most other-centered person the world has ever known. He cared for the poor, the widows, the orphan, the sick, the disenfranchised, the marginalized. He had a heart for others. Instead of building a name for himself, he was building a name for God, for the glory of God and the good of the people around him. Jesus showed us what it looked like to be truly human, to live and use all of his potential for the good 
of the world and the glory of God. And it didn't stop there, right? Jesus, the Son of God, as he entered into the mess and worked with all the imperfections, all the struggles, all the failings of this world and did it with a view towards others, would ultimately go to the cross, right? To pay for all of the collateral damage, right? Of our attempts at pursuing our own name, our own ego, our own pride, our own desires, our own narcissism. Jesus would take the punishment for all of that, all of the evil that we've unleashed on the world. He would take that punishment on himself once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us, as Peter says, back into a relationship with God. That's the good news of the gospel. God comes down, shows us who we are, how we're supposed to live, and then is willing to die for us, uh, for all the mess that we've made of our relationships and our world. And then he rises again to give us a new life, a new shot at living life as we're designed to live. Not people trying to build a name for ourselves in the city, but now a people trying to to promote God's glory in the city, to make Jesus famous in the city, and serve the common good once again. And so it's not surprising uh, that when we turn to Pentecost, the risen Christ has, has been raised. He's at the right hand of the Father. He sends the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And what's the miracle that accompanies Pentecost? Right? Everyone is able to hear the powerful deeds of God proclaimed in their own language. All the language that were divided at Babel, now at Pentecost, Right? All those people are now hearing, all these people from different languages and cultures and tribes and dialects are now hearing the powerful deeds of God in their own language, in their own tongue. And God is building a new people for himself out of all the peoples of the world, this new multicultural community, uh, a new city within the city of Jerusalem uh, to declare the praises of God. It, it's Babel being reversed. And what we see, this church that's formed through this miracle, uh, thousands come to faith in Jerusalem, and uh, all of a sudden we see these people taking this message out with them to the great global cities of the Greco-Roman world. All of a sudden, this same Holy Spirit is moving them out to reach all the different people groups, all the different uh, cultures that are out there uh, in the world. They have a new ambition to make Jesus famous in the great cities of their time. Paul says in Romans 15, 20 through 21, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. You see, Paul has got a new ambition. It's an ambition to make Jesus famous in the great cities of the Greco-Roman world. And that is exactly what he does. He travels to Ephesus. He travels to Corinth. He travels to Athens, the great philosophical center of that time. He travels to Rome itself, the great political powerhouse of the day. And he goes to make Jesus famous, causing riots in towns like Ephesus because he's upsetting the trade there uh, that that, uh, the great goddess has been funding for many, many years. He starts to upset the economic order and the political order and all of the things in this great and ancient world and all because he wants to focus on Jesus. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we see Paul's passion there is to put Jesus back in the center, to make Jesus famous in the urban cities of his day. And we see the final destiny of God's people in Revelation 5 is going to be this international people of every tribe and language and people and tongue all gathered around the throne together. The divisions of Babel, the scattering of Babel, they're all going to be brought together into this beautiful multi-ethnic pluralistic culture all coming together to worship Jesus. That's where we're headed. That's the destiny of God's people. Rather than being a people making a name for ourselves, we're to be a people called out to make a name for Jesus in the world, to glorify God and pursue the good of our cities in which we've been planted. And so what would it look like for us not to seek a name for ourselves, but to seek Jesus' fame here in our city? As you wake up Monday morning and think about all that you have to do to conquer the world this week, your papers, your projects, your classwork, your 
you know, vocational work that you need to be accomplishing, you need to be getting done, uh, what would it look like to think less about, here's what I need to do in my own kingdom, my own little name-building project, and more about Jesus' fame and the good of the people around you, the friends, the family, the dorm mates, the people God has put into your life, your housemates around you. And what would it look like to turn your attention from that ego-building project to God's name and God's glory? What would it look like to build a new scorecard for your life that includes more than just your own personal success, your grades, your success, your accomplishments, your accolades, but but a scorecard that would say a successful life for me involves how I honor and glorify God in my life, how I care for my family, friends, how I'm a good citizen of this city, how I care for the people in my neighborhood, the people uh, around me. Um, What would it look like to to build that out in your own life? To just think, you know, a successful life for me is going to include more than just building my own name. It's going to include all that God would have for me and would desire for me um, to build. And what would that look like for our church, right? To be a church that, that isn't just a church for ourselves. We're not just here to make our name great and go, yay, we're the best out of the 750 churches in Grand Rapids. We're like the awesomest. We have the best this, this, and that, and the other thing. What would it look like to, to recognize just humbly that we're just one among many faithful churches out preaching the gospel? What would it look like to not get caught up in ourselves, but to think about our city, where we could serve in the neighborhoods, we're at, where we're able to partner with other churches in our community, that are really out to spread the gospel and glorify and honor God. What it look like to be a church ultimately for uh, the city and for the fame and honor of Jesus. Followers of Jesus don't seek to make a name for themselves. Rather, they seek to make Jesus famous in our city and pursue the good of the city where he's placed us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way it just slices into our hearts. God, I know reading this text has been Uh, So convicting to me and my own attempts to make a name for myself, uh, a lot of repentance involved and uh, convicting there. And I pray this morning that as we examine our hearts, as we look at the name we're trying to craft and build for ourselves, God, that you would do your work. You'd convict hearts that need to be convicted. You would uh, really minister, uh, heal those that have been hurt, uh, people that maybe have gotten trampled over by other people that are trying to pursue their name and that you would work, just uh, do all that you would do here in your midst with your people, especially as we spend time celebrating your lavish grace for us around your table. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.